Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them, and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers, who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers, that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these, and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests, and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth year to the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes the king, twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food alliance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration forty shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Good morning, City on a Hill. Am I on? There we go. Uh, great to see you, and if you're joining us online as well, it's great uh, to have you uh, tuning in. Uh, how are we doing this morning, everyone? Are you nice and warm? Yeah, that's good. Well, let me begin by sharing a story. Uh, my son, Levi, he's uh, six years old, and uh, he regularly comes into our room at the crack of dawn, and he wakes me up and whispers in my ear, and he says, Dad, Dad, can, can I use your toilet? <laughs> Is it okay if I flush it? To which I kind of grunt, I'm half asleep, and I say to him, Levi, just, just go for it. 
But the funny thing is that Levi, his bedroom is right next door to another toilet. So I asked him the other day, I said, Levi, why do you come through the whole house at pitch black in the middle of the night and you wake me up to use my toilet? And he said to me, he said, Dad, it's because I'm scared of the toilet. You're scared of the toilet. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Why are you scared of this toilet? And he said, "Uh, Dad, it's because it makes creeping sounds. And he starts to imitate these sounds and he goes, (laughs) Levi, he's scared of this toilet. And I want to ask you a question. What are you scared of? (laughs) What are you fearful of? Maybe it's a toilet uh, like Levi, but more realistically, maybe it's the dark or spiders or snakes, or maybe it's losing a job or losing a loved one, or being in debt. You see, we all have fears, and today we're going to look at this theme of fear and what it looks like to fear God. And as we continue our series in the book of Nehemiah, we'll see that he faces more problems, problems inside the city walls and problems outside the city walls. And as we do, I want you to consider three things about the fear of God. The fear of God drives out sin. The fear of God disempowers the enemy. And the fear of God draws us in. But first, before we look at God's word, would you join me in prayer? Father, humble us now. Open our hearts and our minds to listen to you and your words. Father, that we may understand truly what it means to walk in the fear of God. Shape us and the way that we live, Lord, today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, firstly, the fear of God drives out sin. We're going to linger a little bit on this point, uh, but my second two points will be a bit more brief. Uh, So turn with me in your Bibles to chapter 5 of Nehemiah, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, there arose a great outcry of the people and their wives and against their Jewish brothers. Nehemiah, in this opening verse, he faces a problem. And what was that problem? Well, we heard it in the Bible reading just before. So let me just summarize it for you. There was a severe famine in the land, and the people couldn't afford uh, to, to live, to buy food. So some of them had to mortgage their properties, their homes, their land, uh, and, but they lost them because they couldn't afford the repayments. And then others, they borrowed money from the wealthy to pay the king's taxes, but they too I couldn't afford to repay the loans because the interest was too high. So what they do, they, they, they sold their, their children, their sons, and their daughters into slavery just so that they could survive. Imagine that today. Well, the first two examples don't seem all that hard to imagine in Australia, do they? Because interest rates have risen. Inflation is high. I mean, it costs just $12 to buy a lettuce from the supermarket, right? I'm sure God's people were scared. They were afraid, unsure if they would survive. You might be facing similar financial pressures as as God's people were here. But take note of this opening verse that we can't just be silent, especially when there is injustice. We need to speak up and seek help. And that's what happens here. And you know what? The complaint, it reaches Nehemiah. And once again, it moves him to action. And following, I want to highlight three things about the way that Nehemiah responds. And firstly, he responds in anger. In verse 6. I was very angry when I heard their outcry. And these words. And I took counsel with myself. Nehemiah is angry. 
He's angry at the injustice towards God's people. He's furious that they've been treated this way. It is a righteous anger. But notice what follows. He doesn't just respond in the heat of it. He calms himself. He takes counsel with himself. He ponders and he thinks it over and then he responds. I know for me there's uh, lots of times when I'm short-tempered with my kids and I respond in anger over trivial things about them not getting ready for school or about them making a mess or being too loud. And I'm sure if you're a parent here, you can resonate with this as well. But if you're not, um, we, we all live in this crazy, busy culture where it's easy to be impatient and short-tempered We need to be reminded, I need to be reminded of Nehemiah's response here and indeed the words of the Apostle James to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So next time you're you're placed in a situation like this, remember these words and calm yourself and then respond. So firstly... Nehemiah, he responds in anger. And secondly, he responds by calling out sin. Look with me at verse 7. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, You're exacting interest, each from his brother. What was the sin? Well, no doubt when uh, Nehemiah took counsel with himself, he was reminded of God's law. And in Leviticus, uh, in chapter 25, it talks about a law to welcome the poor into your home. And uh, it says that in welcoming them into your home to not exact interest from them. And that's what these, le- these people were doing. The wealthy were, were disobeying God's law. They were exacting interest from God's people, from the poor. But what's sad about this is not just what they were doing, but who was doing it. Did you notice? It was the nobles and the officials. In other words, it was the leaders. These were God's leaders. And instead of obeying God's law, they were acting in sin. Well, the other week, uh, Lauren and I, we watched this documentary called WeWork. Who's seen this before or heard of WeWork? Yeah, a couple of hands. That's great. We enjoyed this documentary, and it tells the story of uh, the CEO and co-founder of uh, this company called WeWork. Uh, This guy's name is Adam Newman. He's a charismatic and messianic-like figure, and he Uh, pioneers the co-working movement back in 2008. And uh, this company, as it grows, within just 10 years, it reaches its peak valuation of $47 billion. $47 billion. Yet as the story unfolds, the, the cracks, they start to appear, and Newman's mistrust of his employees and his misuse of finances. He spends millions of dollars each year hosting these lavish uh, conferences, which are called summer camps, these mandatory events for his staff to come to, and there's unlimited alcohol. He invites celebrities. He continues to set up co-working spaces, uh, which are at a loss. And he also underpays his staff. And he promises them uh, instead to have shares in the company, which are worth really nothing. Well, moments before uh, they they put up uh, an initial public offering, and moments before this, their biggest investor withdraws. And more stories continue to come and news about Newman and his flaws. And in what appears to happen almost overnight, the company rapidly loses value, dropping billions almost by the day. And Newman, he resigns and he takes with him almost a couple of billion dollars while he leaves the rest in his business with almost nothing. 
See, Newman was a masterful uh, manipulator, a flawed leader. And we hear stories like this all the time in the secular world, but they happen in the church as well. It's easy just to brush over sin for the sake of success. To think, you know, we're a church that's growing, a church that people are coming in to know Jesus, which is great. But it's easy to think that we can excuse sin and sin in leaders, abusive leadership traits or misuse of finances. But Nehemiah, he held these leaders accountable and he calls them out for their sin. But what's staggering is the, the, the response that they have is just silence. Silence. They didn't have the guts to, to confess their sin or to apologize for what they did. Rather, they just remained silent. So Nehemiah, he continues in verse 9 and he gets to the heart of the problem. Look at verse 9. The thing that you are doing is not good. It is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Nehemiah, he, he exposes their sin and he says, what you're doing is not right. You ought to be walking in the fear of God. What is the fear of God? Uh, Peter Adam, he, he writes these words and he says, The Bible tells us to fear God. That is, to rightly reverence and respect God, to know that He is great and powerful and holy. He is not our servant. He is not our equal. He is our Lord and the Lord and King of everything. And as surely as we should rejoice in his mercy, we should fear his judgment. I love uh, this definition that we are not equal to God. We are not equal to God. We are to revere and respect him. You see, the leaders in Jerusalem, they were not fearing God. <clears throat> they thought they could manipulate God's people and get away with it. So let me ask you, do you fear God? Do you fear God? Do you have an awe for God, a reverence for God, a respect for God, that He is powerful, that He is glorious, that He is Lord, that He is judge? Some of us might need to hear this, be rebuked by this, <clears throat> to humble ourselves uh, before him and to fear him. So, so far we've seen that Nehemiah, he responds in anger, he responds by calling out sin, and thirdly, he responds by urging them to repent. Uh, in verse 10 it says, Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Nehemiah, he urges them to stop what they're doing and to return their properties and to give them a percentage back of all that they have taken. And guess what? Nehemiah's words, they sink in this time. They've heard that he's harsh rebuke, that they're not walking in the fear of God. And they respond by saying, we will do as you say. And they repent. And Nehemiah, he seals this deal with the priests and he says, make an oath to them and promise them that you will do this. And if you don't, you will face the judgment of God. You see, fearing God is not just about putting him in putting him in his right place as Lord, but his right place as judge. And Jesus, he teaches us on uh, fear. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
He teaches us on fear in the gospel, and he says, Fear him, fear God, who after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. If you're not yet a Christian today, listen to this warning. That because of sin, you face God's judgment. And he has the authority to send you into hell. But because of Jesus, who took on the punishment, the punishment that we deserved on the cross, through his death and through his resurrection, we can have life with him. All you need to do is to repent and believe in Jesus. Repent and believe. Fear him. Fear God. In the remaining verses of chapter 5, we see this uh, beautiful picture, as we heard in the Bible reading, of Nehemiah's character, of his, uh, his godly character of compassion and generosity. And uh, I wish we had time to, to, to delve into this further, but let me just summarize it for you again. Nehemiah was appointed governor, and he was governor for 12 years, and he didn't act like other governors in the land. Uh, instead, Nehemiah, uh, he, he, he didn't use the food allowance or lay heavy burdens on the people. Instead, what did he do? He fed his servants, 150 of his servants every day out of his own pockets. And why did he respond this way? What motivated Nehemiah to act like this? In verse 15, it says, because of the fear of God. Because of the fear of God, Nehemiah was a man who feared God. He was a leader who feared God. He doesn't let sin creep in. He drives sin away. So in this first point, we've seen that Nehemiah, he faces a problem. And this problem, it comes to him and he responds in anger. He responds by calling out sin and he responds by urging the leaders to repent. And he shows a godly example of what it looks like to fear God. Well, now Nehemiah, he faces another problem. This time it's not inside the city walls, but it's outside the city walls. And that's what we're going to look at in chapter 6. And my second point, the fear of God disempowers the enemy. Well, a couple of months ago, my mate uh, who runs a marketing agency, he asked if my daughter Freya and I wanted to be part of the latest Geelong and Bellarine tourism ad campaign. Now, I know... Some people have uh, seen me in this campaign, and um, I've been receiving text messages asking for autographs, so if anyone wants one, I'll be out there (laughs) at morning tea uh, afterwards. But seriously, (laughs) uh, we were in this ad campaign, uh, it's going around Geelong at the moment, and the campaign uh, features a range of different characters uh, showcasing the region's uh, best experiences. And I played the dad in this campaign uh, with my kids, and we went to all the fun kind of places in Geelong for kids. We went to Mopa, we went to Ferry Park, uh, we went to Barrable Maze, and we had a blast. Now, the campaign is titled Everyone's an Influencer. And uh, the fundamental kind of idea behind this campaign is empowerment. It's about empowering you and me, people who live in this region, to use their influence to invite others into this region and experience all these experiences. And I feel like empowerment is a bit of a buzzword today. I certainly use it a lot, and I love to use it frequently. Uh, But what we see here in chapter 6 in Nehemiah, a man who fears God, he doesn't empower the enemy. He doesn't let them have influence over him. What does he do? He disempowers the enemy. Well, turn with me to chapter 6, verse 1. Now, when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab and the rest of our enemies, heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, 
although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakfarim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. Once again, we meet the villains in the story. Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, these three guys, they, they, they come to Nehemiah. And what is the problem this time? Well, they invite Nehemiah away from the walls outside the city to meet with them. But secretly, they just want to do him harm. They want to potentially kidnap him or maybe even kill him. They, ultimately, though, they just wanted the work on the walls to cease. And we hear four times in this chapter that they try this tactic again and again and again. And how does Nehemiah respond? He refuses each time. How can he let this important work of the wall stop so that he meets with them for this seemingly urgent meeting? So they try two other tactics instead. And we won't read them, but I'll tell you what they are. So first, firstly, they send a letter to Nehemiah. And they send this letter to him, and they, they say, Nehemiah, you, you're, you're trying to start a rebellion against the king. So they're trying to uh, persuade Nehemiah to stop working on the walls. And secondly, they try another tactic, and they, they, they bribe a prophet, one of God's prophets, to prophesy to Nehemiah and to tell him that he needs to run for his life and hide inside the temple for fear that the enemies are going to kill him. You see, the enemies are trying to stop Nehemiah from working on the wall and trying to cause him to sin. They're trying to scare Nehemiah. They're trying to make him afraid, to make him fearful. But Nehemiah, he just sees straight through their lies. He's no fool. And in verse 9, it says, For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. So how does Nehemiah respond to this opposition? How does he respond to this problem? Let me highlight two things this time that Nehemiah does to disempower the enemy. Well, firstly, he speaks truth. In verse 8, then I sent to him saying, no such things uh, as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. Nehemiah, he's bold and he's confident. He's not fearful of, of standing up against the enemy and he does it and he calls out their lies. But today we don't just wrestle with people we wrestle with the, the powers and principalities of this world. In other words, the devil. And the devil's described in the Bible as one who prowls around like a lion, ready to devour us. But just like Nehemiah, we can resist the enemy. You can resist the enemy. Because if we truly fear God, if we truly fear God, there is nothing to be afraid of. Not death, not sin, not the devil. Because Jesus has disempowered the enemy for us. As the Apostle Paul says, Jesus disarmed the rulers and he triumphed over them. The victory is Jesus. The battle has been won. And the gospel, it should move us with great confidence. Great confidence to stand up against evil and great confidence to speak truth. Well, not only does Nehemiah speak truth, but he also prays. And at the end of verse 9, he says this prayer. He says, But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Well, throughout the first four chapters... Uh, we've seen that Nehemiah is a praying man, and again and again he, he prays to God. And that's his first instinct in a time of crisis. 
When he faces a problem, what does he do? He prays. And I love the simplicity of this prayer. It's just three words. Strengthen my hands. Strengthen my hands. Sometimes I know I feel like I need to be in the right frame of mind to pray, in the right place or context, and that I need to dedicate a lengthy amount of time to pray to God. But prayers can be short. They can be concise. And that's what Nehemiah does. There's a great book called A Praying Life by a guy called Paul Miller, and he writes these words. Instead of hunting for the perfect spiritual state, to lift you above the chaos, pray in the chaos. As your heart or your circumstances generate problems, keep generating prayer. You will find that the chaos lessens. And that's what Nehemiah does. He prays in the chaos, in a moment of crisis. And we'll see in a moment that God answers that prayer. Sorry. You know, it doesn't matter what problems that you might face or what problems I might face. God wants you to turn to him in prayer. To strengthen your hands. For Nehemiah, it was just to strengthen his hands, literally to build, to keep building. But what about you? You might be facing financial burdens and stresses or spiritual opposition or, or relational conflicts. Whatever it is, how will you ask for God to strengthen you? Turn to him in prayer. As Jesus, he teaches us in the Gospels that, that God is a loving God. He's a loving Father who gives good gifts to his children, to those who ask him. We just need to ask, to pray, to pray for God's strength. Well, a true mark of a person who walks in the fear of God is that they drive out sin, they disempower the enemy. And they do that through speaking truth and through prayer. Well, let's look at my final point, that the fear of God draws us closer to him. So despite all these uh, problems that God's people face, what happens? They keep building. (laughs) They keep building. And what was the result? Well, in verse 15, uh, God answers his prayer and they finish the build. They finish the wall. You know, what an accomplish, accomplishment. This, this work was meant to take years, and they do it, it says, in just 52 days. 52 days. They could have only have done this by God's strength. But check out how the enemies uh, respond once they finish the wall. In verse 16. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and they fell greatly in their own esteem for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The enemies don't run towards God. They run away from God because they were afraid. They were scared. They were fearful of God. And you know, some people respond in this way. They will respond to God by being scared of him and running away from him. But people who really fear God will run towards him. Now John Piper says that the fear of God doesn't draw us away, but it draws us in. And that's what we see in chapter 7. And we won't spend uh, much time in this chapter at all. In fact, most of this chapter is uh, a replica, uh, just, yeah, the same as Ezra chapter 2, I believe. And we looked at that earlier in the series. And it, it looks at the genealogy, the genealogy of the returning exiles 
into the land. But I just want to hone in just on one verse. And it's the final verse. And after Nehemiah appoints God-fearing leaders over the city, he commands them to keep guard, and he concludes with these words, and he says, And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. What a, a beautiful picture. That God's people were now in God's place. They were able to experience uh, his protection with the city walls and his presence in the temple. They didn't let fear of God draw them away, but to draw them in so that they could be with him. Well, as the band uh, comes up, uh, let me end with a story. When my uh, eldest daughter, Zoe, was... Uh, Just a toddler, uh, we went to this winery uh, with my parents. And uh, this winery was beautiful. It was in central Victoria. It had uh, lush vineyards. It had beautiful, magnificent views. had a flowing river through it. And, of course, it had great wine. And uh, after lunch, we decided to go on a stroll uh, through the vineyards. And we went on this, uh, this walk, and... My daughter, she saw in the distance this pink field. And uh, intrigued, we thought, let's go check it out. So we went to this pink field. And uh, the closer we got to it, the more I realized it wasn't a field. It was actually a lake. A lake that was covered in this pink uh, moss or algae. And uh, we, we threw sticks at it and uh, we, we spent some time just hanging around this lake. And uh, I got chatting with my parents <laughs> and uh, turned my, my, my back away from her just for a moment. And uh, as I turned around, I saw Zoe fall into this lake. And uh, as a parent, <laughs> my heart started racing. I saw like a slow motion scene in a film. She slowly fell into the water. Her face was ridden with fear. (laughs) She was submerged in the water and the the moss started covering her. I, I ran across, I stepped in there and I pulled her out into the safety of my arms. You see, Zoe had no concept of a fear of water. She wasn't afraid of it. Yet the moment that she fell into the water, she was terrified. You see, water is a powerful and dangerous thing. And little did she know that the power it could have over her that could cause her to drown. And the fear of God is is kind of a little bit like that. You see, God is powerful. And we are to fear His power in His judgment that He can throw us into hell. But we can also fear His powerful mercy and grace, that He has the power to save. Because through Jesus, He defeated the enemy. He's not our equal. He is our Lord and our King. And this fear should not push us away from God. It should pull us in to God. It should draw us closer to Him, to have a reverence and a respect for Him. So let me return to the question I asked you at the beginning. Who do you fear? Do you fear sin? Do you fear the enemy? Or do you fear God? Let that fear drive sin out of your life. Let that fear disempower the enemy and let that fear draw you closer to Him. What better way to do that now than to pray to Him? So would you join me as I pray? Father, You are a God to be feared. We repent, Lord. We repent for the times in which we don't fear You, that we're afraid of sin or the enemy more than we're afraid of You. 
Lord, help us to fear you, to walk in the fear of God, to be men and women who are shaped by the fear of God, to be marked by the gospel, driving out sin in our lives, disempowering the enemy and drawing closer and closer to you. Give us a love and affection for you like no other. This week we pray. Amen.